Welcome to F5 Financial Management. In this video, I will go over the stakeholders and impact on corporate objectives. A stakeholder is somebody who has an interest in the business. It doesn't have to be a financial interest. With such a broad definition of stakeholders, there are many in a business. Let's look at a few found in most businesses. Ordinary shareholders are also called equity investors. They own the company and take on the most risk. Shareholders are taking a higher risk by investing their money in a company rather than leaving it on deposit in, say, a bank. Therefore, they expect a higher return than the returns offered by risk-free investments. Their main objective is to maximise the value of their investment, be that through dividend income or increasing share value. They have long and short-term objectives. The organisation's directors. They manage the company on the shareholders' behalf. Their short-term objectives would be profit maximisation, leading to increased bonuses, and in the long term, fending off takeovers. The organisation's employees and the trade unions that represent them. Their objectives are fair salaries and safe working conditions in the short term. Job security and pensions would be a long-term objective. Customers. They want a quality product or service that gives value for money. Suppliers' short-term objectives are to supply the organisation and get paid on time. Their long-term objectives would be to build long-term relationships and get repeat custom. Finance providers. Their objective is to get the loan they made repaid in full with interest. They are interested in the organisation's ability to generate cash for this repayment in the short and long term. Government agencies. Their interests are many. They want to ensure that the organisation is following the relevant legislation such as tax, employment, health and safety. The government also has an interest in the organisation's employment levels, encouraging these and motivating the organisation to increase its exports. The community at large. This is a broad stakeholder. Their objective is that the organisation has a positive impact on its surrounding community and environment. There can be conflict between the stakeholders of an organisation because their objectives can be competing and it is not possible to meet all the stakeholders' objectives. For example, between shareholders and directors, shareholders want to maximise their investment and may not agree with the director's methods or their salaries, which are decided by often an independent remuneration committee. We will look at this conflict in the next slide. The organisation wants to maximise its, its profits, and salaries are expenses that eat into these profits. Another conflict that would arise between staff and the organisation other conflicts arise when it does something that is unpopular in a community. For example, a business wants to build a factory in a green space. Local community groups protest because it is ruining the landscape and increasing pollution in the area. The local government welcomed the decision, however, because it provides jobs. Agency theory. As I said, the owners of the organisation are the shareholders but often they don't manage their businesses. This is done by the directors. The director's job is to act in the best interests of the shareholders. However, they may not always do this and could act in their own best interests. For example, deciding to maximise short-term profitability so they will receive higher bonuses at the expense of long-term growth for the organisation and higher share prices in the long run for shareholders. Agency theory deals with problems arising due to the competing objectives between the principal and the agent, i.e. between the shareholders who are the principal and the agents who are the directors. 
To avoid agency problems, the objectives of the shareholders and the directors should be aligned. This can be done by basing the director's bonuses on the organization's net profits and relating the director's pay to their achievement of the shareholders' objectives. However, beware because sometimes short, focusing solely on the short-term net profits can encourage short-term thinking on the director's part. Another option is also to give the, shareholder, or give the directors share options in the company. By giving them share options in their remuneration package, they now are shareholders and their objectives are now in line with the shareholders. Measuring corporate achievements. The main objective of most organizations, as I've said, is to maximize shareholders' wealth. The directors need to put a plan and in place and targets to chart the progress of the organization. But how can they measure their progress? Progress and achievements are measured by looking at the following ratios. Return on capital employed, return on equity, earnings per share, dividends per share. You should already be familiar with some of these ratios. Please refer back to F3 ratios if you want a quick refresher. Now, let's look at an example. These are the financial statements of Top Dog Inc. for the years ended 20x7 and 20x6. How do you get good at calculating ratios in your exam? By practicing. Please pause this video and calculate the return on capital employed, return on equity, earnings per share, dividend per share. Have you done them? Okay, so starting with calculating the return on capital employed. This ratio is very important to investors because they can assess how much profit is being generated for the amount they invested. It can be used to compare the returns offered by different companies. The formula to calculate it is profit before interest and tax divided by the capital employed and then getting the percentage. Capital employed is measured as equity plus interest bearing finance, so long term loans plus share capital and reserves. Here you can see 20x7 and 20x6 return on capital employed. So for every $1 invested, the shareholders are getting back about 6% in 20x7 and 5 cent in 20x6. I am assuming that no accounting policy changes have occurred during the year, so I can compare them. The increase is a good indicator. The organization will use this ratio to assess their efficiency at converting revenues into returns for their investors and to measure their progress towards their target return. They can also benchmark against other organizations in their industry. Shareholders will look at the return offered at Top Dog and what risk-free investments are offering and the returns offered by other companies. The return on equity is calculated by dividing profit after tax and dividends by ordinary shares and reserves. Top Dog has no preference dividends, so we can just take the profit after tax. Again, we can see that the return on equity has increased slightly. This ratio measures how much profit a company generates for its ordinary shareholders with the money they have invested in the company. It is similar to the previous return on capital employed, only profit after tax is used rather than operating profit. And it looks only at the equity invested, whereas the return on capital employed also took debt into account. As you can see, TopDog took on long-term debt in 20x7, so it is more geared than in the previous year. This impacted the return on equity, which is sensitive to the gearing. Directors may feel the return on equity does not reflect their achievement to maximize shareholders' return, as the profit after tax is used and tax rates are outside their control. Also. Solely looking at profits, like with the or return on capital employed, is a very short-term viewpoint to take. 
and long-term investments that grow shareholder wealth may be ignored. The return on equity ratio is useful to benchmark against similar companies who are applicable to the same tax laws. Earnings per share. The earnings per share are calculated by dividing the profit after tax and preference dividends by the number of ordinary shares in the company. The result is the amount of profit per share. For Top Dog, this increased to 40 cent a share in 20x7 from 33 cent in 20x6. This increase is good and reflects the increase in profits. However, it does not reflect the actual earnings received by the shareholders. It just shows the shareholders share of the profits after tax. Earnings per share is not a useful comparison tool to compare other companies. However, the growth in earnings per share is something that can be compared. Dividend per share. This is calculated by dividing the total ordinary dividend by the total share capital issued. If there are any special one-off dividends paid in the year, these are deducted from the dividend figure. TopDog did not issue any special dividends in the year, so there is no deduction, and we see that the dividend has increased dramatically. In 20x6, it was 10 cents a share, and 20x7, it was 25 cents. The dividend in TopDog increased by 150%. This is a huge increase. Investors want to see a regular dividend. And because the companies are reluctant to increase dividends, even for a particularly good year, because they may not be able to sustain it during leaner years. Therefore, by increasing a dividend, this sends a good message to shareholders that the company believes that its current profitability and dividend, which is increased, is sustainable. This would cause share prices to increase. If a dividend rates were to fall, then this would send a negative message to shareholders indicating the profits are reducing and the company does not see the, imp the situation improving in the foreseeable future. This would cause the share price to fall. A lot of planning and forecasting goes into the dividend policy. An organization's dividend policy depends on its shareholders' profile. Some shareholders don't want to receive a regular income from their investment, instead wanting the money to be reinvested in the organization which will increase the value of their shares. This could be due to higher tax rates on dividends versus the capital appreciation on their shares. And some shareholders invest in shares to generate a regular income. Shareholders will look at companies' dividend policies in the past and invest in it if it matches their needs. So changes in the dividend policy can cause shareholders to sell their shares and invest their funds elsewhere. This can cause share prices to fall and leave the company open for a hostile takeover. The company's dividend sends a message to the shareholders and it should be a consistent one. A shareholder's return on investment is made up of the dividends and capital gain on the value of their shares. How do we measure it? Let's say the share price of Top Dog was $5 in 20x7 and $4.50 in 20x6. You know that the dividend paid in 20x7 was 25 cent. You can then calculate the total shareholder return. So it is the current share price less the previous year's share price, add on the current year's dividend, and then divide it by the previous year's share price, and then make it a percentage. So it is 16.66% for Top Dog. Corporate Governance. As you know, there is a separation between the owners and the management. Directors have a fiduciary duty to the shareholders to act in their best interests. However, over the years there have been countless corporate scandals 
where directors have acted unethically to inflate profits and share prices. Organizations should implement corporate governance codes of best practice. These have the following impact. Corporate governance codes increase directors' accountability. They aim to reduce the shareholders' risk due to unethical behavior. Directors' salaries should be decided by an independent remuneration committee. These codes ensure a more balanced board of directors by having non-executive directors who are independent and not involved in the daily operations of the organization. The chairman of the board of directors can never be the CEO. These roles are separate. The chairman should be an independent when they are appointed. Although corporate governance is not obliged under law, in most countries, companies usually must comply with corporate governance codes of best practice to gain a stock exchange listing. A stock exchange listing means that the company must produce financial reports annually that give detailed information about the director's salaries and pay attention to their corporate social responsibilities.